I have uh, a number of uh, remarks I'm going to make, so don't get worried that I'm not going to get finished, but I have a number of things that I think will be helpful to us in kind of pulling some of these things together. Uh, the, the, the way we're studying chapters 24 through 35 is not in order. I think we knew that from last week, and I told you that I needed to, kind of for my own brain's sake, uh, look at these, this, the text uh, starting in chapter 24, and then we did uh, all the way through uh, 20, what was it, 28, 27 last week. And then uh, this week we're doing 32 to 35. Most of your questions in your lesson were on those chapters. Uh, the, the, uh, we had skipped over chapters 13 to 23, which was basically judgment on particular nations, and I think we're all grateful that we didn't have to do all of that. Uh, the ones we did last week are called the Isaiah Apocalypse, and we had a lot of judgment. We had uh, the uh, understanding of a lot of the things that the Lord is doing, will be doing in judging nations because even though he chose one nation to be his own particular uh, children, that, he, that all of the nations in the world, because he created the world, all of the nations are really responsible to him. And so as they break the covenant that he made with them about taking care of the earth, uh, then he has justification for uh, judging the world. And then uh, uh, last week we also saw that there's this remnant that keeps popping up. The ones, there, there's always a few faithful that the Lord has uh, in, his, in his people and in his plan. <clears throat> Today the, the title of the lesson in your lesson book was called Restoration. And although there are a few points, uh, in fact, one chapter deals more specifically with some of the judgment. Uh, the, the main theme of these chapters uh, is the restoration of the coming kingdom uh, of righteousness. And chapter 35, most of the scholars look at, the, at chapter 35, which we'll look at last this morning, as being <clears throat> the climax of our, our trekking through all the way chapters 1 through 35. Uh, Chapters 36 to 39 have to do with a specific historical event that we'll be looking at. Uh, and so the end of the, the prophecy of the first part of Isaiah actually finishes at the end of uh, chapter 35. And so <clears throat> many people see that that glory, the blessing that we're going to be looking at in chapter 35 is a kind of a culmination, uh, the high point of what has happened in chapters 1 through 35. Uh, we will be going back next week in chapters 28 to 31 to a section that's called the woes, W-O-E, woes. Um, each chapter is woe in a particular way. Uh, there are actually five woes, and in our, in our chapter 33 is the, is the fifth of those. Uh, but next week we'll be back in chapters 28 through 31, uh, and yet... Even as God is giving Isaiah this message of judgment, there's always, there's always, there's always this theme of restoration that keeps popping in. Remember, it's not chronological. We can't really track specifically from beginning to end of what Isaiah is prophesying. Uh, but that's the, that's the way poetry is, and that's the way that the Lord inspired uh, Isaiah to do this. The other theme that's being developed, not only judgment that's followed by restoration, but the other theme that is so exciting that is being developed is this tracking through of the prophecies of the coming king, of the Messiah. And back in chapter 7, remember that the Lord himself will give you a sign, a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The first uh, giving of a prophetic word about Messiah is in chapter 7. And that is the fact that, it will, that he will be God with humanity, God in human flesh. Uh, chapter 9, remember we had the child will be born, the son will be given, the government will be upon his shoulders. Name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the second incident of a specific prophecy about Messiah coming. In chapter 11, we had this stump that is coming out of the, 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 spring, the sprout that is coming out of the stump of Jesse, uh, the line of David and the fact that uh, there will be a, 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 the Messiah will be coming in that direct lineage of the kings of Israel. 
and that the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, and he will be doing his ministry uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have three instances already in Isaiah where we've seen this prophecy just coming, to the, coming up uh, for air a little bit and then going back down again. Our fourth one is actually in chapter 32, verse 1, where we, where we have, see, a king will reign in righteousness, and the rulers, uh, the, the under rulers will reign, uh, will rule with justice. This now is the fourth way that Isaiah is telling about the coming Messiah. Uh, he's the one who reigns in righteousness, uh, and uh, he, uh, also just the fact uh, as chapter 32 goes forward, that everybody in this kingdom is now going to be focused on righteousness instead of how, how to avoid righteousness, how to be unrighteous. Uh, the characteristics of this king's kingdom will be that they, that they will be focused on righteousness. So thinking about that, I want to just make a few remarks about an issue that we're going to be coming up with uh, often, not just in this part, but when we get into chapters 40 through the end of the book of uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, we're going to be uh, thinking about a kingdom, uh, about a kingdom that, that is safe, that is secure, that uh, the people uh, are trusting in this righteous king. Uh, and many people uh, understand that another way to describe this kingdom uh, is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, which speaks about a millennium, a 1,000 year period. It's only in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 that that name is actually given, the thousand years. Uh, but so so we, we talk about the millennium and there are several ways, several biblical ways of looking at the millennium. Many believe that there will be a literal reign of a thousand years on the earth where uh, the well, where, where nature will be back in its, its pristine created state uh, without, without all the, the death and the, and, the, and the warring and all of that, without all the weeds in your garden and things like that. Uh, that Israel's Messiah, the, the uh, eventual son of David with a capital S, uh, that son of David will be reigning literally in, on earth uh, in Jerusalem, which becomes the center of the earth. Many, many Bible-believing people understand that these prophecies would be taking place literally. And there is language even in our lesson today that, that kind of pinpoints it to place and, and to event. Other believers who study the scriptures just as, as scrupulously uh, and as sensitively as the people who believe in a literal reign of the Messiah on earth say that no, there, this is now picture language. And of course with poetry, we have a lot of pictures. We have uh, pictures of lions laying down with the lamb. We have the desert blooming like the crocus. Uh, we have a number of things that are poetic that, that kind of expand our understanding. Uh, but people who take the point of view that there will not be a literal reigning on earth of Messiah, uh, that they see that these promises now, figuratively speaking, are available to believers who are indwelt by the Spirit and who now have the well-being, the righteousness, uh, the righteousness of Christ that then are living out uh, these, these prophecies. We'll be seeing more of this as we go along, but I just want to introduce ourselves to the fact uh, that this is something that we have to uh, grapple with. I do want to say that, and I, I come down on the, on the side of the people who believe in a literal reign on earth, but I know that many of you uh, do not take that point of view, and I'm not going to force my view on you. I will say that people who take the literal point of view also understand that because it's scripture, because, it, because God's word is living and powerful, as we found out in Hebrews, uh, it, it's applicable to us that, the, that much of what uh, we might see as literal taking place under the reign of the Messiah can also certainly be applied to believers in this day and age who are indwelt by the Spirit and who do have the kind of righteous life, who, who are living according to, to God's plan. Not perfect, yeah, of course, uh, but, but living in, in that way. And so it's possible, I believe, to take 
w without messing with the scripture, without trying to just prove our point. It's possible to take uh, the way that Isaiah and other prophets describe this kingdom. It's possible to take that in a spiritual sense for us, even if we may be looking forward to a literal reign on earth. Uh, so as we look at the passage today, I love the way our workbook uh, guided us into thinking not only about the facts that the, that the poetry describes for us, but how, what does that mean? Uh, how, where, is, where does that uh, come in my life today? How does this promise of well-being, of righteousness, of peace, how does that apply to me? So I think uh, it's helpful for us to look at it uh, from that point of view. It is clear that Isaiah is looking at his context, his historical context. Remember back in chapter 7, he's talking to a real king. He's talking to Ahaz. He's giving prophecies to Ahaz. He's looking at uh, what, what in, in prophetic language uh, is happening right now with the enemies of Israel and Judah. Uh, and so uh, Isaiah is thinking about real men uh, uh, in King David's uh, biological lineage. They are of the line of David. He's thinking about real enemies of this nation that are threatening the well-being of the people of Judah. He's thinking of real judgment that is going to be falling, first of all, on the, on the people in the northern kingdom during his lifetime, but also then uh, after his lifetime, about 150 years, happens to this, this the small nation of Judah that uh, Isaiah was giving his prophecies really about. There's real judgment, but he also is thinking of a real restoration. And we do know that in the scope of the history of the Old Testament, uh, as the judgment came on the nation of Judah, they were, ca they were taken captive to a foreign land. They were uh, prisoners in that way. And there was a, a, a Exodus number two that allowed these people to return. Under King Cyrus, they were able to come back to their land. So we're thinking of some historical facts. We're thinking of Isaiah's historical viewpoint. But we know that in God's inspiration, uh, there, there in many places are, is more than one uh, understanding, one interpretation. There can be a near-sighted one, but then there can also be one that takes place in the future to Isaiah, which the last half of the book is about, as well as even future perhaps to you and to me, because much of what we see here, we can't, we can't really identify with any particular era of world history or uh, of any particular enemies, any particular ages, any particular judgments. So that's the beauty and the wonder of the scripture, of God's mind that gives to uh, a prophet uh, words that do make sense to him, but also are projecting farther and farther in advance than even that person under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would really know. I, I don't know, I cannot tell you, you know, how much of all this future stuff Isaiah understood. The Lord could give him whatever he, he needed. Uh, but we do know that there are historical um, records of what Isaiah was talking about specifically that have already been, been fulfilled. Uh, that gives us real confidence, does it not, to say if God fulfilled it then, he can certainly do again uh, in an even larger scope what he, uh, what he promises to do. And so uh, the many, many people think that uh, it's frustrating, I, and I was thinking when I was uh, writing this outline on the board this morning, uh, you know, maybe when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to say is, why didn't you put all this prophetic stuff in one particular book so we could start at the beginning and go to the end? <laughs> I, I probably won't be wanting to do that because there'll be other things that will be really interesting to me. But it is a frustration, is it not, for those of us who want to be linear and to know what the facts are, to have this stuff popping up again and again. And yet that's the character of God. His mind is so much 
greater than ours. His plans are so much greater that I have to rest in the fact that I may not understand everything and I may not be able to explain to you everything uh, that is in this prophecy. But we do know that there is the truth of God in this inspired word that God gave to Isaiah and for us uh, in the 21st century. Uh, some people have looked at prophecy uh, prophecy even in our time as like standing and approaching a mountain range uh, and you see a number of peaks and the peaks look like they're pretty close together but if you're climbing the mountains you realize that you have to go down into the valley and then trek up the next mountain and down that one uh, and that's kind of the way that that we look at uh, the near appearance of many of these prophecies, as well as then the challenge of looking forward into what God is, was giving to Isaiah. So I, I just wanted to be sure that we're starting off together on this so that we don't get too frustrated with the fact that we can't give um, a particular timeline for all of this. Now having said that, let's look at chapter 32 because in chapter 32, uh, Isaiah is talking about the righteous kingdom. And of course, with verse 1, he's introducing the righteous king. Uh, in chapter 33, he's talking about how even in the midst of judgment, the righteous will be delivered. And so my, my topic for chapter 33 is the deliverance of the righteous, righteous people. Uh, first of all, the righteous kingdom, and then deliverance of the righteous people. Uh, the third thing in chapter 34 seems to be speaking particularly of the day of the Lord's vengeance. We thought we were finished with the judgment. We still see this happening uh, in chapter 34, the day of the Lord's vengeance. And finally, the day of the Lord's blessing. We finally get to that wonderful, uh, joyful time that is, that is mentioned there. <clears throat> so as we look at chapter 32, Looking at the righteous kingdom, there's first of all in verses 1 to 8, uh, the righteous reign of the king. What does it look like? Uh, well, verse 1, uh, not only will a king reign in righteousness, but rulers will rule with justice. The, uh, the, the judges, the, uh, the, other, the people who are, have, have local governing, they are going, righteousness is going to just be endemic and, and part of the DMA, DNA of the people at this particular time. Uh, each person will have a, a sense of well-being. Verse 2, each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Don't you love uh, the vision of that, the, the thirsty land and the, uh, the water with that regard? So there will be, uh, in this righteous kingdom, there will be uh, well-being, but there will also be a receptivity to righteousness. You're, there's not going to be the, the tension between what's unrighteous, the, one, the fools that are being talked about in verses 3 to 7, those fools who are doing what fools do, and that is say, there is no God, and so I'm, I'm the boss here, and uh, I can twist the truth however uh, it is that, I, that is to my advantage. Uh, there will be no more fools. Uh, in verse 6, the fool speaks folly. Uh, his mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. Uh, he, the hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. Uh, keeping go on going in verse 7, talking about the scoundrel. But in verse 8, this now is what is characteristic of this kingdom, and that is nobility. Instead of foolishness, now characteristic of the kingdom will be nobility. The noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. Remember, in Hebrew, if you have a word repeated, uh, twi if it happens twice, you think, ah, I'm, I need to find out why this is being emphasized. If it's three times, like it is here, as in chapter 6, holy, 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 we take note of the fact that, that, that this is something that we need to listen up to. We need to listen. And so nobility is something that is a, is a wonderful prospect, is it not? Noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. This is characteristic then of this righteous reign of the king. Uh, going on in verses 9 to 14, uh, we see that there will be a judgment that happens that really then prepares the way for the Holy Spirit 
to come and to be the active agent of God in all of this. Verses 9 to 12, did you like that he's talking about uh, complacent women again? Why women are, uh, um, I don't know, Isaiah had a wife. I'm not sure why, why, why he, uh, the Lord speaks to him in this way, but uh, he does speak about complacent women. You know, early on, I think it was, was it chapter 3 where we talked about the women that were full of jewels and, and they're ordering their husbands around, get me another drink and that kind of thing. Uh, well, now here the women are, com they're not bossing, but they're complacent. Uh, they are complacent because apparently whatever um, threat there had been to their, the, the, the peacefulness of their life in their particular situation had, had been removed. And so they are complacent. They are um, satisfied with themselves, with their situation. They're not keeping their eyes open for what's on the horizon, what's going on of actual danger or deficiencies. They think, aha, we can breathe easily now. Many of the commentators think that this uh, sense of well-being for these women happened uh, at a particular time in, in Israel's history in 701 BC when the king Sennacherib, whom we'll be looking at in um, about in two weeks time, uh, when he received a message uh, that drew him away from the siege of Jerusalem uh, and went back, he went back to his own country. Many people feel that that's what is going to happen because it says in verse 10, in a little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about the devastation that will happen when this king comes back again. Uh, because he only went back home to take care of some housekeeping things. And then he's going to come back again and still be uh, menacing the, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah. Uh, so in verses 9 to 12, these women are warned, this is what's going to be happening to you in the very near future. And then in verses uh, 13 and 14, we see a devastation of the land. The fortress will be abandoned, the no noisy city deserted. Citadel and the watchtower will become a wasteland, the delight for donkeys and a pasture for flocks. You just kind of see that th this, is, uh, this is uninhabited land. There, there isn't the ability for the land to provide for people. And then in verse 15, we see why this happened. Uh, because there was a purging that happened in order to make way for the coming of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and isn't that what judgment does? It, it purges, whether it's in my life and yours where, where we are convicted of sin uh, and we come to Christ for, uh, re in repentance and we ask to be forgiven, then that makes way for a, the Holy Spirit to then use us. The, the junk is gone. And so now the repopulation of this nation and the, the, the rejuvenation of our lives comes after the kind of judgment that comes down. Don't misunderstand me. In Christ, we will not face God's judgment because Christ took that judgment upon himself three hours on Calvary. Uh, but you and I, as we're as we're trudging through the Christian life, we have moments, don't we, where, we, where we're convicted of sin and the, the Holy Spirit moves us then toward repentance and toward revitalization in our spiritual lives. Uh, so thinking about how in this particular historical situation these women uh, needed to be convicted of sin, but now what's happening as a result of judgment makes way, verse 15, for the Spirit to be poured out on high and then what, the spirit, what happens when the spirit comes is the desert becomes a fertile field. A fertile field seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert. Righteousness live in the fertile field. And then don't you love verse 17? It's another one of those refrigerator verses, isn't it? Um, the fruit of righteousness will be peace. Now, unrighteousness, th there is no peace. There's always looking over your shoulder, always wondering what is, what, what's going to happen next. Uh, the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. Uh, Ezekiel goes, even, goes further when he talks about uh, the coming of the Spirit. Uh, in Ezekiel, you don't need to turn to it, but in Ezekiel uh, chapter uh, 36, uh, there's a wonderful uh, uh, promise that Ezekiel gives <clears throat> in uh, verses 26 and 27. He says, the Lord says, I will give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart uh, this heart of stone and I will give you a spirit of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. Be careful to keep my laws. And then over in chapter 37, when he has this picture of the dry bones coming together and there being new life in that, in, in verse uh, 14, he says, um, I will put my spirit in you and in you you will live and I will settle you in your land. Uh, and he says, then you'll know that I am the Lord. Uh, there are other prophecies that kind of amplify on what Isaiah is introducing here in, at the beginning here uh, in verse 15. The spirit will be poured out. We know historically, now that we have the New Testament, that historically there was a, a new way that the spirit acted after... Uh, Christ died and rose again and then sent the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but the Spirit has been active uh, since creation. The Spirit of God was moving on the waters. And so uh, how this actually uh, was taken by the first readers, I'm not really sure. Uh, but we can certainly understand that, the, that the, the desolation that came because of Israel's sin is now replaced by the life that comes in the spirit. And the effect of that will be righteousness, uh, peaceful dwelling places, and secure homes. This, of course, is what every nation wants for their people, don't they? They want, they want people not to be afraid. They, they don't want to have, the, have their nation or their city um, at risk with regard to, to uh, the enemy. Uh, even the people in Israel today don't have that kind of, uh, of settled peace in their homes. Uh, we, we grieve for them in many ways, don't we, uh, as they are in their homeland, but they certainly don't have the kind of protection and peace and security that is described here. So we think, because of that, that, that even though today it's hopeful to see that Israel is now a nation again after so many centuries, uh, that still hasn't given the righteous king, and it is not given the equilibrium and the well-being that's going to come that's described here in our chapter 32. In chapter 33, the, the Lord uh, delivers right, the righteous people even while he is judging the rest of the nations. Uh, and here in verse, 30, verse 1 of 33, uh, we see the woe to you, O destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Uh, was this spoken specifically to the nation of Assyria, which was the, uh, the enemy of the day with regard to Isaiah's time? Quite possibly. What does it say about this destroyer? Uh, he says, you who have not, woe to you, O traitor, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. Remember back in chapter, I forget which one, which one it was, the Lord had a specific word to this very prideful king of Assyria saying, I used you as my, as my tool of judgment on my people, but you took it way over the top, and you decided that you were going to be me. And so you now are being judged. And here's another one of those woe kind of things with regard to that. Uh, Verse 2, there are righteous people that are in, uh, in this place while this judgment is going on. And they say, they cry out to the Lord, <clears throat> um, O Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in the time of distress. They are experiencing uh, around, all around them, they are experiencing the judgment of God. At the thunder of your voice, the peoples flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. You plunder, O nation. Your plunder, O nations, is harvested as by young locusts. And it's just kind of being devastated with regard to that. Uh, so there's destruction going on. But even in the destruction, what's happening in verse 5? The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. One of the ways that God is glorified is when he judges the wicked. Remember, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And a holy God cannot have unrighteousness, wickedness in his presence. And so one of the characteristics of the glory of God is that he judges the wicked. Now, why doesn't he do it right away? 
we don't know, except that his ways are not our ways. And so, verse 5, even in the midst of this, the Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. It's hard to see an actual timeline here, but it certainly describes uh, the glory that the Lord will be getting for himself, this sh being the sure foundation uh, being this rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And what's the key to all of this? What's the key to this well-being of the righteous, even in the midst of all of this difficulty that's going on? The fear of the Lord. We've talked about the fear of the Lord as being a healthy kind of fear, but also a wonderful, strong kind of respect with regard to that. The fear of the Lord, of the judgment of the Lord, is, is very, very real. Uh, I saw last night on, on TV the pictures of, I forget where it was, in the Philippines or somewhere, where there's a volcano that is erupting, and it is absolutely glorious. And I thought about the fact uh, that, that the, the volcano is, is a fearsome thing, uh, but it's also beautiful and glorious as it pours out uh, this, this kind of fire uh, upon uh, the, the earth. And so the people... In, in that area can't be complacent about this mountain that's, that's in their backyard. They have to be careful about that. They have to see that the fear of this volcano, now turning it over to the fear of the Lord, uh, is, is a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing with regard to uh, the God of judgment. Uh, the verses 13 to 24 then talk about uh, how, uh, <clears throat> how God has plans now for the righteous. Uh, there will be devastation, there will be judgment on the wicked, but God has plans for the righteous. Um, the, verse 14, the sinners in Zion are terrified. They are terrified, but, verse 15, uh, who can dwell with this kind of uh, righteous judgment? The one who walks righteously, speaks what is right, rejects gain from extortion, and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ear against the plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemporary evil. This is the man who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be in the mountain fortress. His bread will be supplied, and water will not fail him. Uh, kind of moving us without any transition into uh, the, the, the well-being that comes uh, from a righteous life that is lived in the kingdom under the righteous king. Uh, there are several other, several psalms talk about uh, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in a holy place? He has clean hands and a pure heart. Uh, this is a picture of dwelling in, this, in the righteous kingdom of the Lord. There will be fear in the hearts of the righteous because of all this stuff that's going on around them. But the Lord reassures them about describing the lives of people living in his righteous kingdom. Uh, then in verse 17, <clears throat> Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. In your thoughts, you will ponder, it'll be kind of at the back end of your, of your memory, all of this terror because of, of, the, of the glorious prospect that's given in verses 20 to 24. Uh, there's going to be a peaceful abode. Uh, the tent will not be moved. The Lord will be a mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, it is he who will save us. So even in the midst of this woe that is happening to the wicked, God has plans to rescue the righteous. What does that look like physically? I don't know. I've thought about that a lot in recent times because I do think that in our day and age, as we are a part of even a nation that is... A, is a, vocally, uh, as well as actions, abandoning God. Uh, we who are the righteous because we are biblical, uh, we are going to have to deal with what it's like to be uh, in, in the midst of such terrible uh, injustice, unrighteousness, and, and fixing our eyes on, as it says in verse 17, our king in his beauty. Uh, hard, hard to translate all of this into... 21st century, but it certainly uh, is a part of God's plan to move forward uh, in protecting his righteous ones in, in the midst of a, a really a very desperate 
and sinful situation. So deliverance of the righteous is in chapter 33. Chapter 34, we get back to vengeance again. Uh, and I didn't write this now, so, um, but as we think about this, there will be worldwide judgment. Remember last week we talked about the worldwide judgment. Uh, it says, verse 1, Come near you nations and listen. Pay attention, you peoples, and let the earth hear. This is a megaphone of God speaking uh, with regard to worldwide judgment. It is clear that in verse 2, the Lord knows what's going on. It's not that he's sitting up in heaven, all this wickedness going on, and he's twiddling his thumbs. He's aware of this, but he's waiting the time that he will be then uh, bringing this uh, wickedness to an end. Uh, uh, we see in verses 2 to 4 in chapter 34, we see the kind of apocalyptic language that shows the, the, the mega judgments uh, that God will be putting forth. Uh, we see a lot of that language in, in Revelation. Uh, and in fact, uh, verse 4, all the stars of the heavens will be dissolved, the sky rolled up like a scroll, all the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Our Lord in Matthew 24, when he spoke about the future, about the, about the, the judgment that is coming, and, and he himself descending in the clouds of glory, he uses this kind of language, Matthew 24. Uh, Peter uses this language in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he describes the day of the Lord. He, he uses the same kind of language. Revelation 6 talks about the clouds being rolled back as a scroll uh, and, and all, all of this judgment then coming upon uh, the, the, the nations and upon the earth, the cataclysmic nat natural disasters that are happening. And so this worldwide judgment in verses 1 through 4 recapitulates some of the themes that we've seen in our other passages and also then moves us forward with some more specific uh, uh, judgment language regarding now the, na the nation of Edom. Verse 5, why does Edom come in to this regard? Uh, specifically, there are specific things, place names even, uh, Basra um, and uh, things that, ha that are specific to Edom. What is it about Edom that is so specifically offensive to God? Well, Edom is descendant biologically from Esau, who is Jacob's twin brother. These two babies were in the womb together, and yet Jacob takes one path and Esau takes another path. Uh, we saw it, we see it in Genesis just describing their early life. But the nation of, of Edom has been, uh, even when uh, the Israelites were coming from uh, e Egypt over to the Promised Land, it, Edom refused to let uh, the Israelites pass through their territory, their geography, their land. Uh, Obadiah, there's this little prophecy in one of the minor prophets. Uh, one chapter only, but it's directed specifically to, Ob to Edom. Obadiah speaks words to Edom, and one of the things that God has against Edom in that prophecy is that they just stood by and gloated when the enemy came and carted off Israel and Judah uh, in judgment. They were enjoying the fact that their now um, distant physical relatives were being, uh, were being oppressed and being made captive. Uh, by these enemies. And so I'm not going to take time to go through these verses because we've already looked at specifics about, uh, about God's judgment uh, for that. But just to say that even in the midst of moving forward in these oracles that God has given to Isaiah, we see that there is still going to be uh, the judgment upon the wicked. And as I say, judgment on the wicked should not be um, something that makes us mad at God because God has every right to judge uh, those who are wicked and who just uh, stomp on his reputation and his glory. But then we get to the day of God's blessing, the Lord's blessing, and that's in chapter 35. It's especially glorious because after th chapter 34, where we've been you know, kind of dunked back into judgment, uh, and before we get to chapter 36, where we have some real-time uh, evidences of enemies that are coming on, on God's people, we see this gorgeous picture 
of the blessings. First of all, we see the restoration of nature, verses 1 and 2. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for glory, for joy. And then the, the locations that are mentioned, you had some help with that, with these locations in your lesson. This will be uh, a, a recreation of nature, the natural, the natural world that has been really devastated by the judgment that God has, 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 bring, has brought. <clears throat> Some people think that this would be picturesque of the millennium, of the fruitfulness, of the lushness that happens uh, as God now uh, is, is, has recreated the earth. Um, the glory of this and the splendor of the Lord is on display in this recreation. That's wonderful. But in the midst of, this, of his vengeance, we have another little vignette, verses 3 and 4, of what God says to these righteous people. He says, this is going to come, so now this is what you look forward to. So strengthen your hands, steady the, the knees that are shaking, uh, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, but he will also come to save you. He also always has the salvation of his own people uh, as, his, uh, as one of his uh, primary characteristics. And so then, in verses 5 through 10, we see what some people call the peaceable kingdom. Uh, we see uh, the, the nature, the, the lame leaping like a deer, the mute tongue will shout for joy, uh, ears of the deaf unstopped. And by the way, this is how Jesus proved his messiahship for those who were questioning him. Look at Isaiah. Are the, are the deaf beginning to hear? Uh, are the blind seeing? Uh, are, uh, are the lame leaping like a deer? Uh, John the Baptist got this answer to his question with regard to that. Jesus used this passage with regard to what he was saying. And then he says, uh, no lion will be there, nor any ferocious beast on it. They will not be found there. I'm not going to talk about lions because you thought about that in your workbook. But only the redeemed will walk there. And don't you love these last verses? The ransom to the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the ultimate kingdom that uh, the, those who have been imprisoned in sin, in unrighteousness, are now trekking on this highway, this highway that takes them, uh, the exodus from that kind of slavery into the kingdom, the, the peaceable kingdom, that is ruled by this king that we, we saw in chapter 32 that is ruling in righteousness. So even if we understand much of this to be future even yet to us, there is still a legitimate way for us to see spiritual truth in this passage. Um, so, does your life re resemble the barrenness of the land that is uh, being described by Isaiah? Is your life being watered by the Spirit? Do you have fresh plants growing, figuratively speaking? Are you beginning to bloom like the crocus? Well, you know, the requirement for peace and confidence is knowledge of and trust in God. And, of course, we are in the right place for finding that out, aren't we? As we, look, as we look at what God has said. You know, the Holy Spirit ha has, is promised in this passage. He has come, and he does indwell every believer. But, and it's only he that can produce the righteousness in you and me as we yield to his control. So is a peaceful and confident life, life characteristic of you? And how has the truth that God uh, has placed in our hands in this section of Isaiah how has that given you confidence in him, even in a life that may be kind of falling apart at the edges? The peace and righteousness and confidence that comes from trust in the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these confident, strong, wise, uh, very, very strengthening words. May you be our strength, even as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.